If it weren't for the fact that so many millions of gullible people have swallowed the snake oil of so-called flood geologists in a desperate, straw-clutching attempt to bolster their faith in a Bronze Age narrative for which there is no evidence whatsoever, and that they warp their children's minds by teaching it to them, the pseudoscience known as flood geology could simply be dismissed as laughable. As it is, it represents an assault on the human intellect and a further embarrassment to an already manifestly embarrassing, albeit self-proclaimed, sapient species, and should be challenged at every opportunity. Although I'm no scientist of any kind, I'd like to offer a challenge based on my own observations in the field. First, some background. Flood geology is a modern-day dusting off of an idea that prevailed among some European geologists during the first half of the 19th century. Their idea, informed in part by their reading of the Bible, was known as catastrophism and was promoted as a counterbalance to the uniformitarianism that was widely held by those who adopted James Hutton's understanding of the planet's history. Uniformitarianism was popularly misunderstood as a kind of doctrine, that the Earth's strata had accumulated at a slow, steady pace over the eons with no noticeable perturbations. This is a misreading of Hutton. Such angular unconformities as the one exposed at Sicker Point, the observation of which had a profound impact on Hutton's thinking, put the lie to the popular misunderstanding of what uniformitarianism means. Uniformitarianism is really another name for methodological naturalism. Simply stated, it means that if we want to understand a geologic feature that was formed in the distant past, we need to find processes at work in the present that could account for such features. We will not, in other words, seek supernatural explanations for natural phenomena. A well-known example from the Grand Canyon should suffice to illustrate this principle. Near the top of the canyon lies a 100 meter thick sandstone unit that exhibits what's known as cross bedding, a complex structure sectioned by small diagonal beds that dip both north and south around 24 degrees on average. If we want to know how these beds were formed, we have to look for modern analogs, which we find all over the world in desert environments. The Coconino sandstone is a lithified aeolian deposit. Flood geology was pioneered by Henry Morris in The Genesis Flood, published in 1961. Morris was not a geologist. He was a hydrologist who imagined that certain features in the geologic record can be accounted for by a worldwide deluge that created those features in a matter of weeks about 4,400 years ago. Attempts to demonstrate this hypothesis do nothing but fail over and over. Nevertheless, fundamentalist Christians continue to cite Morris as an authority. Flood geologists attempt to explain the features of the fossil record by appealing to an observable generalization, that simple animals tend to be fossilized lower in the column than more complex animals, while ignoring virtually every detail about those animals. Flood geologists explain that general tendency in three ways, by hydrologic sorting, by the superior intelligence of mammals over that of reptiles, and by the generalization that birds are, in any event, the last animals to drown in a flood, and are hence found higher in the geologic column than the earliest reptiles. But the notions of flood geologists cannot be sustained if one actually looks at the rocks, which said apologists generally have not done. This brings me to the main point of this video, which I will pose as a challenge to any young earth creationists who happen to watch it. Have you looked at any rocks? Are you willing to look at them? There are two ways that one can do this. One can visit museums and study their collections, or one can go out into the field and collect, making careful observations about the circumstances in which fossils are found. It's not a bad idea to do both. Creationists, have you done your homework? Are you willing to get your hands dirty in the interest of understanding the history of your planet? I want to talk a little about crinoids, an order of echinoderms that first appeared in the fossil record during the Ordovician period. There are many extant crinoid species, but they don't look much like the older forms. 
they don't build long stems, for instance. The fossils I'll be showing you came from shallow marine deposits that were laid down when large regions of North America were inundated by a shallow intercontinental sea. I want to show you three small collections of fossilized crinoid parts ranging in age from the Lower Devonian period, around 400 million years ago, to the Upper Pennsylvanian, around 300 million years ago. These fossils were all collected from Oklahoma and Arkansas within an area defined by a 150-mile radius. The first collection, an assortment of Devonian period crinoid stems, comes from a site in the Arbuckle Fold Belt in Oklahoma. If you look carefully at the texture of the stems, you'll notice that all the features of their columnals are more or less flush with the diameter of the stem. In other words, the stems exhibit very little surface relief. They're all circular in section, and most include a hollow five-pointed asterisk at the center. There are at least three different crinoid genera present in this deposit. One of the characteristics they all share is that of more or less featureless stems. The second collection, from exposures of the Mississippian period Boone Formation in northern Arkansas, includes crinoid stems that are very different from those of the adjacent older period. A glance at the material will make this clear. In this instance, we see stems that are covered in tiny spines, exhibiting several different patterns of spininess, and many that are oval in cross-section. These are clearly not the same species one sees in the Devonian deposit just discussed. These crinoids hail from that period of Earth's history that represents the apex of crinoid development and possibly the furthest aerial extent of their range. Like their Devonian period antecedents, these animals spent their entire adult life tethered to the ocean floor. The flood geologist's explanation that all the fossils in my collection were formed in a single catastrophic event, thus cannot account for the difference in Devonian and Mississippian period crinoids. But faunal succession and evolution can. The third collection comes from the subsequent geologic period, the Pennsylvanian, or Upper Carboniferous. These fossils came from a site in eastern Oklahoma, located almost exactly midway between the Devonian and Mississippian sites referenced earlier. They represent a time when the oceans were richer in molecular oxygen than at any other time in the planet's history, and a vigorous pulse of evolution was driven by those elevated oxygen levels. Crinoids remained an important component of the benthic communities of the Pennsylvanian period, but they no longer dominated those communities as they had in the previous period. Note the huge difference in the stems of some of these crinoids compared to those of earlier periods. A mere glance will tell you that these animals are far different from those that were fossilized lower in the column. Flood geology cannot account for this difference but evolution certainly can. I could show you a lot more crinoid fossils from many other sites, but either I've made my point with these three photos or you simply cannot hear my point. Again, I want to pose my challenge, which, if you're fair-minded, you'll surely admit is reasonable. Do as I have done. Support your conclusions, not with the feeble arguments and judiciously mined quotations of flood geologists, but with actual hands-on research. Go out into the field as I have. Spend countless hours gathering fossils, making careful notes about the particulars of the deposits in which they're found. Spend even more hours cleaning, sorting, and examining those fossils under magnification. Compare the clearly related species that come from deposits of different ages and flesh out your understanding of the history of our planet. Alternatively, do this kind of work and then present convincing evidence that Noah's flood happened as described in the early chapters of Genesis. If you can do this, I will, of course, give close consideration to your research. I'm impressed by evidence, and you will not find me close-minded if you can present some.